Between 1871 and 1872, children in the Charlestown and Chelsea area of Boston, Massachusetts began to report terrifying encounters with a person who they shockingly said was another child. The youngsters had all been lured to a remote area with the promise of sweets or money by a boy only slightly older than they were. The trust they had shown their peer was sharply punished as he then proceeded to strip and bind his victims before beating them with fists and a belt. Over time, the attacks became increasingly more violent as the perpetrator began to slash and torture those he managed to lead away. While all the victims returned home traumatized but alive, some were left permanently disfigured. When the authorities finally identified and arrested a suspect, the parents of Boston breathed a sigh of relief. However, nobody could have known that 13-year-old Jesse Pomeroy was far from done. He would soon be on his way to becoming the youngest serial killer in America's history. Born on November the 29th, 1859 in the Boston neighborhood of Charlestown, Jesse Harding Pomeroy was the second son of Thomas J. Pomeroy and Ruth Ann Snowman, his brother Charles being some 20 months older. These details we can be relatively sure of, but beyond that, multiple versions of Jesse's childhood branch off as his story has been mythologized over time. Some say that his father, Thomas, a veteran of the Civil War, a fireman and an alcoholic, terribly abused not just Jesse, but the whole family. Allegedly, Jesse once ran away after a savage argument between his parents, but Thomas tracked him down, dragged his son home then, after ordering him upstairs, stripped his clothes and beat the boy with a horse whip. Other historians, however, say there's no definitive proof that Jesse was abused by his father as a child. Although harsh punishments were not unusual in 1800s households, Jesse himself doesn't mention being beaten by his father in his own autobiography, but he does note that two teachers and an uncle had gotten physical with him. As an infant, Jesse's right eye was damaged due to an unspecified ailment possibly because of a virulent infection. This left the boy's pupil covered with a white film. Due to his unique appearance, Jesse was known to be bullied and humiliated by his peers. It said the marble eye was deemed to be enough reason for others not to want to look in Jesse's direction. He also had other very distinctive facial features, including an overly wide mouth and ears that stuck out noticeably from the sides of his head in addition to his frame being overall a lot bigger than the other boys of his age. These features, in addition to the fact Jesse rarely smiled and had periodic epileptic seizures, made it extremely difficult for him to socialize with other children. Things were not much better with his teachers who described the boy as strange, not a bad student, but difficult to understand. Along with this, Jesse didn't take corrections or criticisms well and threw a tantrum if things didn't go his way. Interestingly, however, he wrote in his autobiography that you must not think that I was always bad at school. I gave my teachers trouble enough, I'm sure, but as a general thing, I was what is commonly called a good boy. It seems that Jesse Pomeroy's idea of a good boy was significantly distorted from the beginning. It was not just that he was antisocial to the point others felt that there was something not quite right with the boy. He found himself isolated and a loner, but it would be what he did during his time alone that would hint at what was to come. He displayed characteristics that would later be recognized in what is now known as the McDonald Triad, a set of three factors that are considered to be predictive of or associated with violent tendencies, particularly homicidal behavior. One of these factors is cruelty to animals, a trait Jesse adopted at a very young age. 
When he was only five, Jesse allegedly stabbed his neighbor's cat and tossed it into a river. And before his 10th birthday, the boy killed his mother's lovebirds by twisting their heads until they were decapitated. But instead of there being any real consequences for his actions, Ruth simply decided there would not be any more pets in the Pomeroy house. While she may have believed this may have put a stop to his sadistic actions, in truth, it only meant a change of target. In his solitary, Jesse enjoyed reading violent novels about the Indian Wars and seemed to be deeply influenced by the descriptions of brutal torture. At first, Jesse reenacted these tales in seemingly innocent scouts and Indians games with other children, but soon the line between pretend play and reality began to blur. It was on the Boxing Day of 1871 when four-year-old William Payne was found in the abandoned Powderhorn Hill outhouse, partly dressed, his wrists tied, and his body covered in bruises. A couple of months later, on February 21st, 1872, seven-year-old Tracy Hayden was left with a broken nose and missing teeth in the same outhouse after his encounter with the young assailant who had reportedly threatened to cut off his genitals. The news of eight-year-old Robert Meyer going through a similar experience on May the 20th outraged the people of Boston. At the time, the police had little to work with. A big boy with brown hair wasn't really enough to identify a suspect and interviews with several dozen children failed to yield results. After seven-year-old Johnny Balch was beaten and tortured while his attacker fondled himself, a reward of $500 was offered for the capture of the boy torturer, as the press named him. The parents in Boston were terrified their child would be the next victim. However, after reading the description of the attacker from the Boston Globe, Ruth Pomeroy was concerned for a very different reason. She was quite sure that the boy torturer was her own son. Things would go from bad to worse for Ruth as Thomas deserted the family. Some claim this was due to an argument that broke out after he had beaten Jesse. Either way, Ruth was now left to raise their two children alone. She rented a small storefront in South Boston and set up shop as a dressmaker. Along with her two boys, she moved into a small apartment across the road from her new business. As handy as this may have been, it may have also occurred to Ruth that moving from the location of the crimes would not only bring them to an end, but also throw police off the trail of her son. Neither of these things would prove to be true. The frequency of the attacks against the children only increased and so did the level of violence. On August 17th, two weeks after the relocation of the Pomeroy family, seven-year-old George Pratt was taken by an older boy who tortured his victim using needles and biting chunks of flesh from his body. The following month, there were three more attacks. On September the 5th, six-year-old Harry Austin was kidnapped, bound and stabbed with a knife repeatedly under his arms and between his shoulder blades. Less than a week later, on September the 11th, seven-year-old Joseph Kennedy was also beaten and stabbed. A common theme of these attacks were cuts to the face and other attempts to disfigure. On September 17th, five-year-old Robert Gould went through a similar ordeal with an older boy who slashed his scalp and threatened to kill him. This time, however, there was a significant difference in the aftermath. Despite his young age and extremely traumatic experience, Robert was able to give a very detailed description of his attacker, who was, according to the five-year-old, a big bad boy with a funny eye, or milky eye, that resembled a marble. This detail alone would have been enough to eventually lead the police to the door of the Pomeroy family. But Jesse would inadvertently deliver himself right to them. On September the 20th, 1872, he decided to stroll past the South Boston Police Station. As he did so, a police officer stepped out of the building. By his side was Joseph Kennedy, one of Pomeroy's victims. The officer 
beckoned Jesse inside, at which point the boy denied any part in the attacks and began to cry. Later, a selection of his victims from both the North and South Boston attacks were asked to identify the assailant. Upon seeing Pomeroy, one of the boys jumped for joy, exclaiming, that's the boy who cut me. At last, the boy torturer was apprehended and the parents of Boston could finally relax. That relief, however, was short-lived. At his trial, Ruth stated her son was dutiful, obedient and never cruel, but despite initially denying having any involvement in the attacks, Jesse eventually confessed. However, at the time of his arrest, he was a minor, meaning after he was found guilty by the juvenile court following his confession, he was sent to the state reform school for boys at Westboro instead of prison. There, he was supposed to remain for the term of his minority. In other words, for six years until he turned 18. But because of his exemplary behaviour at the institution and the tireless efforts of his mother, Jesse was released early on February 6, 1874, after serving less than a year and a half of his sentence. Before long, this decision would prove to be a terrible mistake. On March the 18th, 1874, at about 8 o'clock, 10-year-old Katie Curran headed out to buy a notebook. The task was simple and the young girl should have returned home promptly, but she never did. Reports say Katie was last seen at 327 West Broadway, where Jesse Pomeroy's mother's dress shop and her son's newsstand were located. Knowing Jesse's reputation, many feared the worst, but at the same time, it was believed Jesse had rehabilitated and had only ever attacked young boys. Surely, he had nothing to do with Katie's disappearance. Police searched the store but found nothing, and soon their attention was drawn elsewhere when it was reported that a boy had seen a girl matching Katie's description climbing into a carriage with a man who then rapidly departed. A month went by without signs of the young girl, and then another child vanished. Four-year-old Horace Millen was last seen on April the 22nd, 1874, walking with an older boy. It was just hours later, at 3.45 in the afternoon, that two boys discovered Horace's half-naked body in a marsh near Dorchester Bay. The boy had been savagely beaten and stabbed, his body partially mutilated. Authorities quickly arrived on the scene and found a set of muddy footprints which they tracked back to a wharf half a mile away. Their witnesses said they had seen Horace with a teenage boy who had lifted him down from the wharf before the pair walked towards the marshes. Jesse Pomeroy's name had already been brought up during the investigation into the disappearance of one child in the area. Now it was time to call in on him once more. At 10 p.m., the officers arrived at the Pomeroy home, where they found Jesse with scratches on his skin, blood on his clothes, and on a knife in his possession. The 13-year-old's boots were also covered in mud and matched the prints found at the crime scene. Needless to say, Jesse was immediately taken into custody, and it's claimed that once there, police confronted him with Horace's remains in an effort to make him confess. After they asked if he had killed the boy, he coldly replied, I suppose I did, before asking that they not tell his mother. After news spread about Jesse's arrest and the unthinkable things he had done to the young child, the business at Ruth Pomeroy's shop plummeted. In May of 1874, she was forced to shut down the store. A man named James Nash, who owned a nearby grocery store, purchased 327 Broadway a couple of months later and began to remodel the building while Jesse awaited trial for Horace Millen's murder at the Charles Street Jail. It was on July the 18th that two men knocking down a wall in the basement made a horrifying discovery. Beneath a pile of ash and rubbish, one of the workers found a brightly coloured piece of fabric. Upon closer inspection, he made the gruesome discovery of a skull. 
Beneath the rubbish, further badly decomposed remains were found, and they were quickly revealed to be those of Katie Curran. Ruth and her older son Charles were arrested in connection with the murder, which prompted Jesse to confess to luring Katie into the basement and slashing her throat. According to him, she had entered the store by mistake looking for a school card. In an instant, his twisted mind spun into action. I told her there was a store downstairs. I followed her, put my left arm about her neck, my hand over her mouth, and with my knife in my right hand, cut her throat. I then dragged her to and behind the water closet and put some stones and ashes onto the body. He would later retract this confession and that of killing Horace Millen, denying having anything to do with either murder. But when the sensational trial began on December the 8th, 1874, Jesse's lawyer knew there was no point in trying to deny his client's guilt, but rather argued the boy was insane in hopes of saving him from the death penalty. The defense's witnesses included Jesse's mother, who recounted the number of childhood illnesses that had left her son suffering from insomnia, dizziness, and frequent violent headaches. Alienist Dr. John Tyler told the jury that based on his assertion, Jesse was a lunatic who had no motive for his crimes and lacked a normal sense of morality which explained his unconcern to the suffering of his victims and the consequences of his actions in addition to the brutality of his offences. In turn, the prosecution's witnesses argued Jesse showed no signs of insanity and knew very well the difference between right and wrong based on the fact he had tried to avoid getting caught and being punished. After the closing arguments, it took the jury five hours to make the decision. Jesse Pomeroy was found guilty of the first degree murder of Horace Millen on December the 10th, 1874, at the age of 14, making him the youngest person in the history of Massachusetts to be convicted of such a crime. Against the jury's recommendation, the judge sentenced Jesse to death by hanging. However, because of the fact he was so young, two governors refused to sign the death warrant and Jesse's sentence was eventually commuted to solitary confinement for the remainder of his life. During his years in prison, Jesse Pomeroy wrote several books, including his autobiography, in which he maintained his innocence. Of the torture of the seven boys and the two cruel murders, he said, why I think that I did not do those things, I have told some time ago. I need not repeat the reasons here, that those acts were done by one and the same person, that the acts were cruel, and that the person who did them was a cruel person, I will not deny. But that I did those acts, and that I am a cruel person, I do deny most emphatically. I did not kill Horace H. Millen or Katie Curran, and even if I did, it would show that I was more insane than anything else when I did it. In 1914, three psychiatrists examined Pomeroy. They found him to be sane, but also described him as a cold, paranoid manipulator. Believing he didn't belong in prison, Jesse studied law books and composed requests for a pardon, in addition to attempting to escape numerous times, but he never got out. After spending just over four decades in solitary confinement, Jesse was allowed to move to the general population in 1917. Twelve years later, in 1929, he was transferred to Bridgewater Hospital for the criminally insane. This move caused quite a media sensation. This was his first voyage into the outside world for decades, and upon seeing how much things had changed, it's claimed he asked, where have all the horses gone? At Bridgewater on September the 29th, 1932, Jesse Pomeroy, the boy fiend, died of a heart attack at the age of 72. Till his last day, 
he failed to show any remorse for his evil actions. Thank you for watching. Right then, take care, and I'll see you next time with another story to make you say, Well, I never.